morning. Christian greetings to each one that is here. It is a blessing to be here this morning, a blessing to be here to be encouraged and, and again gather around God's Word. I am, uh, I was blessed in, in the service thus far. I uh, hope that whatever I have to share this morning is an encouragement and not, doesn't feel like a brick on our head as far as uh, what we should or shouldn't be doing. <clears throat> And it seems to me that, uh, as I was pondering uh, what uh, Lauren shared, it, it seems to me that sometimes out of our deepest pain or our biggest woes come our greatest ministries, our greatest ability to help others to see, to sense when there's a need around us. Because when we've uh, experienced things, we ourselves are more aware of, of what is going on. This morning I'd like to uh, just start in by reading um, Revelation chapter 21, a, a, a part of the chapter that is often read at a funeral as we think of, a, of heaven and, and actually hell, for that matter, the first eight verses. I'm just going to read it uh, here for kind of a, a platform to, to begin. And I saw a new heaven. This is John's vision. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And, and he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of water of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I... I chose to read that, and I, it probably would have felt maybe right or better to end with those verses rather than to start with those verses. Uh, but the, the topic that I'd like to look at this morning, uh, I've simply titled this, at least for the sake of my notes, uh, The Harvest. And I don't know if, okay, maybe you can see that. I'd like to focus this morning on The Harvest. <coughs> And, and think about the harvest, and I know that uh, this is something that we're very familiar with and is a, a topic that's addressed often. But in this, and, and just briefly, thinking about the ultimate harvest, the end of life, what I just read is what we're all, I think, looking forward to as God's children, a place where there's no pain, no sorrow, I can't even imagine what it's like to be at a place like that, where every tear that is shed, God lovingly wants to wipe away. And on and on and on, there's the ultimate harvest, the one that we're working for every day, the one that, we, that keeps us going when the chips are down, when things aren't going well. This is what we envision that God wants to give his people that are faithful, faithful in going forward. Now, having said that and, and uh, focusing on the harvest, uh, there are a lot of, of different things that, that, uh, that bring about a harvest. And on a very practical, uh, very just kind of an elementary level, this morning we are kind of in a harvest for what was done yesterday and the day before. And even last night. We, we are reaping the harvest of whether we went to bed early or went to bed late. We are reaping the uh, Sunday school teachers. They, they 
either had a maybe successful time in Sunday school class based on how they studied last night or yesterday. And I'm not saying that you, the Spirit can't lead. I'm just saying that the preparation time that we put in, the, the effort that we put in, often has a direct link to the harvest that we then experience. And so that is why I wanted to start with, with the end of life. And I, I would also, uh, verse 8 always is the sobering one for me when I read this, because uh, whichever side you want to put this on, left or right, the, heaven is on one side and hell is on the other side. And there is a harvest there. That is the end result of whatever has happened or not happened as we were preparing for that harvest, the ultimate harvest. And a lot of, a lot of times when, we, when the subject is addressed, there's a lot of focus on the here and now. And I, and I think that while there's an ultimate harvest, there's also a here and now harvest that we, we reap kind of what we sow, how we live, uh, we can expect things. And I want to bring moderation and balance to this, this topic uh, so that I don't... It, it's easy for a preacher to get on his soapbox and say, this is it. And if you do this, this will always happen. It, not quite that way. There are circumstances that, that come that will... And I probably will say this a couple times. I want us to focus on this. There are circumstances in life that where it doesn't always add up. It doesn't always seem like, okay, I've done this, now this is going to happen. And if we approach it that way, we're probably going to just create more problems than, than give answers. But the truth of the matter is so simple, is, is that we, when we sow, we expect to reap something. Uh, we're, we're, lo we're looking forward to a harvest or doing, you know, something that will, will grant us a harvest. And this is just a play on uh, Galatians 6, 7. It's, I shouldn't say a play on It's just a different version than what we normally hear, the King James Version, uh, where it simply says, a man reaps what he sows. And so I'd like for us to hold, try to hold, as we go through this topic this morning, Two, two truths that are, that are evident at the same time. There's a long-term harvest and there's a short-term harvest. And sometimes we see these little clips that, where people say, instant karma. They thought they were going to do something, they were, and just like that, something else happened and it really didn't turn out well. Well, that's not really what I have in mind. However, there's this truth that what, how we live and what we do really kind of sets the groundwork for what we can expect out of life and how life will treat us then. So I often think of, when I think of sowing and reaping, I think of the, the garden that we plant in spring, and now it's close to, we're harvesting already, we're eating uh, some things out of the garden, or the corn crop, versus the apple tree that we planted and I don't know how many seasons it typically takes until the apples finally come, until we finally get a harvest. And so there are short-term and long-term, and both are very important. In the short-term, we prepare for the long-term. And I think as Christians, everything that we do should have an awareness that is built, built in. There are just a lot of different things that, that and I'm, uh, well, I'm not prepared to, to hit every angle of this. As individuals, every one of us sitting in the pews this morning, we experience a harvest. We experience something that we've worked for yesterday, and now today is kind of, it's either coming to fruition, good, bad, or otherwise. But as groups, we also experience things. And these are evident truths in the harvest that, that we have to hold, both of them at the same time. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the group experience of a harvest and how that affects us sometimes. Whole groups of people, I want to say churches, have attitudes. Things happen sometimes that kind of feed into these things. And uh, 
just one thing that just kind of random pops into my head. Uh, I was recently made aware of a church setting where there was a, uh, a young boy that is mentally handicapped. And the mockery that goes on that is directed toward this, this uh, boy just broke my heart. And I thought, isn't there someone there that says, no, this, this can't be? Isn't there an adult there that wasn't from this church? But it, that doesn't matter. It doesn't make us perfect. I'm just saying it because we as a group have a responsibility to make sure that the bitterness that someone feels isn't a harvest, a bitter harvest because of, of negligence. And as you think about the king, and I'm, I'm going here because I think of the kings of the Old Testament where it went up and down. You had a king that worshipped God, and God, there was a harvest there. As long as he was on the throne and they were worshipping, things went well. Things were going forward. And the next king came in, and he influenced the group, and the whole group went the other direction. And I'm saying it because I think that we, we either... Uh, reap the rewards or suffer the consequences of a group harvest. And we have to be aware of, as individuals, we all either build or tear down in that group experience. Those are maybe Old Testament, uh, Old Testament uh, stories, but I think they're as pertinent for our day as they were, uh, they always have been. Environment. This is what I talked about a bit earlier. Environment affects our harvest. There was no, um, no way that Lauren could have known there was going to be a hailstorm that they were going to either meet or pass. There was no way. And sometimes in life, we hit the hailstorm, and we don't know why. We don't know why it happened we don't understand, we don't even understand why God allows it to happen, but it happens. And it affects the harvest. And it, it affects maybe decisions that, that are made. There are unfaithful uh, marriage partners. There are churches that there's less than ideal circumstances. And you could, you could make your own list of things that happen that affect the harvest. And in each one of these circumstances, there are individuals that are responsible for the way that they interact with the environment that they're in and, and how that will affect them going forward. And we often say the, the word or the words, are, they going, are we going to get bitter or are we going to get better through our experiences? And it's, our, it's our up to us. But at the end of life, still there's this one thing that keeps just like, just like a stake out ahead, just keeps sticking out right there. And it's this one thing. All of us here, no matter what the environment was, all of us here are responsible to, to plant and to grow and to prune or whatever it takes. We are accountable for the harvest that we will eventually reap. As much as we like to think, well, okay, this happened. We, it, it's, it's the same. Just some simple, basic uh, concepts, truth. Every principle of, of God that is lived out will have a certain harvest. And every action that does not reflect God's will or his principle has a resulting harvest, or outcome. So basic, so simple. The harvest is equal or matches the action that we put in. Now that, that's, the, that's on the surface, maybe just the surface level something. And we, I like, personally I like to make it very simple. What you sow, you will reap. But sometimes there are some, some things that, that uh, make it a lot more complex than, than all of that. And I, I talked about this, and I'll, I'll keep talking about it. In the natural world, there's drought. There's floods. There are wind. There's, there's things that affect that harvest. And in our world, the devil is active. He's putting us to sleep. He's, 
rousing us to animosity. He's doing all kinds of things to destroy the family, the church, the community. He's out to throw a wrench in the gear and make the harvest as awful as, as, we, as he can. Now, I, I'm not, I did not show up this morning to give you an easy something. And I, I don't know, sometimes I wonder when it's my turn to preach if people are coming to church because they just, just can't wait to, to hear something that will improve their lives or will make it. And I know that's kind of silly to even think things like that, but, you know, we, we get so used to what we have that we don't think about those things. And, and I, I don't want to downplay the, uh, the need to go to church and to sit or be with those that are teaching on a regular basis. We're aware of, of what the devil wants to do. I think all of us that are my age or even 20 years old are aware of what the devil wants to do. But the simple truth just keeps, it just stays there. What you sow, you will reap. It, it, we, sometimes I feel like making it a lot more dramatic than that. There's got to be a reason for the way things are going. There's got to be someone to blame. But it, it really, sometimes it is just so mundane and so average that we miss that. What we sow, we will reap. How we live, that's how we will, that, that will be our reward. I'm going to share some things here, some, some quotes here. One of them is, uh, excellence is boring. I don't know if you've heard that one or not, but you've heard versions of it, I'm sure. John Acuff says that. Between the excitement of uh, a new something, we've got this new church plant or we've got this new mission, between the excitement and until that really gets to the place where we're now experiencing blessing, there's a lot of weeding and pruning and, and just boring hours of things that, that no one really sees. And I know you take a risk when you think about... Um, Athletes or military, people that do things, mundane things, over and over and over again. But a 90s child, growing up in the 90s and 80s and 90s, reading the newspaper even, how many of you remember reading about Michael Jordan scores 55 points a game? And, you know, and I'm sure that these youth up here don't even know anything about him. And he was just a, well, he is a sports figure with a soul. I'm not trying to minimize that, but I'm saying that I don't like to use a sports figure. But there is something that I'd like to tell you. We, I didn't have the internet, but I, and I didn't have a phone. I had the paper. I watched. I was, I was and I was always impressed by his fadeaway jumpers and what he did. But you know what he says? For everyone that went through the basket, there were a thousand that missed. It's boring. Endless amount of practice. On and on and on. And sometimes I think that to, to spiritualize that this morning, to think about our faith, how, many, how much time do you spend at church or in a Sunday school class as opposed to the rest of your life. And when we start thinking about the things that we, the times that we actually show up to practice or where people see it, just a very small amount. Excellence is boring. And sometimes from the seeding to the harvest, there's a lot of boring steps, pulling weeds, getting dirty, just doing whatever it takes. And that is the way our faith is too. Sticking with it. God is watching. And I, I, I think that God has a reason for that. I, I don't think that any of us believe that we're going to stumble into heaven just because. We just, we just happen to end up there. I don't think that any of us think that. But sometimes it's hard to stick with it. Harvest is often very predictable. Uh, every, every action is, is somehow linked 
to something else. And, and it's so easy to go from day to day and not even think about it. Um, I know that we know the verses, and this is not necessarily harvest, but we talk about fruit, by their fruit you shall know them. We can predict what people are doing by the fruit that they leave or the fruit that we see. Uh, the, the fruit, the harvest is very specific to what we're doing today. And if we're kind of lazy about our whatever we're doing, we can kind of expect that. Something that has impressed me uh, is how people have gone from mediocre to something that's dazzling or a lot more spectacular simply by keeping close record and watching very closely what their input is and then seeing how that measures in the end. One man said that um, he noticed that he spent an excessive amount of time on his phone. And so he decided he's going to see if he can change that, and he started reading books. And he said, it's crazy how many books he read simply by making time to read books. And he thought about the fact that there are many other areas of life where we do the same thing. We make time for something, and something else happens. We make time to uh, maybe relate to our neighbors, and something else happens. And so it's, it, that really impressed me. And so I, I challenge us, or, or I encourage us, to keep careful record. And, and if, if we have a habit that we just cannot break, Write it down. How many times have you encouraged someone yesterday? How many times did you complain about someone? Write it down. Well, I don't. I really don't like to think about that. But take careful note and, and see how, how that works out. Exercise your faith, and it will grow. I know we all don't like to be in an uncomfortable position where we kind of just exercise our faith, we talk to strangers, we, we exercise our faith in whatever way it needs to be exercised. Uh, sometimes we allow others to take advantage of us because of our faith. But if we exercise our faith, faith grows. If we feed our fear, worry grows. We, we, we tend to worry more. If we, if we sow in our relationships, how we respond to others, that brings a certain harvest. If we're friendly, if we're likable, if we cultivate that, that is what grows. Individuals sometimes say, why did that happen? I didn't see that coming. But you know what? Proverbs 30, uh, 33 has a very simple answer for relationships, I think. It doesn't talk. Solomon doesn't say anything about relationships. But he says this, surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter. It's just kind of a natural thing. It just happens. You, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. And so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. All of these three things have like something that happens and then something else happens. Now, I know we're not going around beating each other on the nose, not normally anyway. And I'm talking about relationships, but sometimes... I, I hear this a bit of confusion. Well, then, why, why don't people like me? What's going on? And sometimes emotional body slams are handed out. And we have to be careful. As Christians, we have to be careful. We will reap the benefits. Or we will experience the, the, the shattered trust and the ruins that, that come along with it. When it should be obvious that if we don't respond well, this is what's going to happen. There's a sense of entitlement that maybe I shouldn't even talk about in church, but we hear it all the time. And it, sometimes it becomes, it seems like when we don't know what else to say, we'll just say, well, there's, they just have a sense of entitlement. And what do we mean? And it's that sometimes I, I think, well, it's time for me to then think, well, what does that mean? Do we actually even know what we're talking about? And I, I would ask you that. What do you mean when you talk about a sense of entitlement? Well, in my mind, when we're talking about a sense of entitlement, we're simply saying that people are expecting something from 
something they never really even did. They are expecting good results out of nothing. Gain for something they didn't work for. And, and the, the, it is not a popular subject to talk about personal responsibility and accountability to others. That is as unpopular as it gets in our, in our time. One man said, go on social media and just put up a post and say that, that account personal accountability is very necessary and, and you are responsible for whatever you do. And he said, you can start a fire just like that. I don't know. I haven't tried that. But I think all of us understand that the sense of entitlement where we almost think that people say things like, um, well, I know we're supposed to start at 6 a.m., but well, what's wrong with 605? And that sort of thing happens. And it happens not only to employers, it happens all across the board. And I know there's grace to be, to, to have, but uh, there's this sense of entitlement that, that really militates against focusing on our harvest and sowing well and, and maintaining lives that, that God can honor. Blaming others. Blaming those for a bad, others that, that th as the reason for not having a good harvest. You know, I could, this could be a long subject. I'm not going to minimize that where we come from can hurt or help us. I'm not going to minimize that. But I'm also going to tell you something. As adults, if we stand here and blame our parents for where we're at today, we are going to be the losers. And I'm not, not saying that we don't acknowledge maybe what happened wasn't always perfect because no home or, or house or home is perfect. But blaming, one of the reasons why it's so easy to blame others is because it really only takes one muscle, just this one finger that points out. And when I have to take responsibility or we have to take responsibility for our actions and where we're at and where we're going, then it becomes a lot harder. Please don't have a bad harvest because we stand here and blame. When I demand a harvest where I have not put in any effort, that means simply one thing. I have a sense of entitlement. I don't deserve a good harvest. When I dream about rewards where I have not put any effort in, I'm foolish. It's foolishness. If I plant something today and expect a great harvest tomorrow, Probably I'm impatient. Most things take a little more time to grow. You know what? When we compare our harvest with everyone around us, we're probably foolish. Because God is the one we should compare with. I like this verse in Proverbs 12, 11. Solomon said it well. I'm going to read it in the NIV. Those who work their land will have abundant food. But those who chase fantasies have no sense. We all have a plot. We all have, God has given us something. Sometimes I, I kind of, it's disturbing if I think about how I push back on where God has placed me. I, I want to say this yet before I get away from it too far. The sense of entitlement and blaming others for our lack of a good harvest or good outcome. Did you know that most people, I'm going to say successful people, and when I say successful, I'm going to put in insert, not just rich people, but I'm going to say faithful people, people that have walked in faith and stayed the course and are already reaping a harvest here. A lot of those people did not come from ideal backgrounds. I know I've talked about this before, but sometimes the worst the, the worst setback can be our greatest, greatest asset when it comes to going forward. If we have been hurt badly, we often have a willingness to help others that are hurting or have been hurt. I'll just leave that. But I want to, I want, I just, there, there's just this element that when something bad happens, it doesn't mean that the harvest is now bad. It doesn't mean that we have to stop. No matter how bad it is, there's always something that we can take from that. 
and turn it around. God is able. I want to insert that. There's more that could be said. I, there's just the simple thing of actions equal results. Generally speaking, where you invest your time, where you put your energy, that's, that, often, uh, that often equals how much you gain or reap from that. And, and it's just such a simple truth. It's so easy to understand that it's boring. It's like we all know that. However, if you're like I am, I don't always live that. I don't always live in that, that truth. There are things that are out of our, our control. I know that. But I'd like to now just move to something completely different. Something that kind of, uh, most of the time when I hear uh, the law of sowing and reaping expressed or talked about in public, I hear kind of this thing of, each one, well, we're responsible. And this, we are, it puts responsibility on my shoulders and on your shoulders to live a life, not just Sunday morning, but every day of the week, so that there is a harvest. And I think all of us understand with that, but I'd like to kind of close with this, this thought process that doesn't seem selfish to me at all, that provides a harvest that is beyond just the end of my and your lives. And I, I, I'm saying this because I think this is so important. If church groups and families are going to go forward, this element has to be in place so that it doesn't end with this generation or these people. And that is simply the gift of, of encouragement for those that may be struggling. In other words, we move from our own insecurities and whatever we're feeling, whatever our struggles are, to carrying water for those that are around us. And this I find maybe even a notch more challenging than just keep living right for myself. It's easy to kind of hoard our blessings and just sit on it. But I'm, I'm here to encourage you. Don't be conservative when it comes to encouraging others. There are stories. There are many thousands of stories about people that said, I was not sure how I was going to keep going. And I think of just a bunch of stories. Little things. Very practical. In your house. In your home. Little things add up to big things things and make the harvest good or bad one simple thing wives do you encourage your husband or you criticize him husbands do you encourage your wives those are little things maybe they seem little but they're like the, the sand in your shoe that you carry a thousand miles and it's just uncomfortable and we can encourage each other to make we can end up having a good harvest or a bad one most of us somewhere, sometime, have the opportunity to encourage someone on their way. We have the opportunity to water, to carry water, to be there, to encourage, to stand beside. And I know we also have the, the opportunity to complain about everything that happens, and that has the opposite effect. I was, uh, in preparation for this, I, I came across this story. Some of you might know uh, Priscilla Scherer. Scherer, I don't know if I pronounced her name right. Public speaker, author, um, wrote her, I haven't read the book. Um, her most recent book is Fully Surrendered and obviously not on the same wavelength with maybe an Amish Mennonite person. But I, I noted what she said, and this is where I, I, it struck me, and, and it, I, I want to hand this off to you as your assignment for this week and maybe for the rest of your life. There are opportunities that we sometimes miss because we don't think maybe that they're... Someone... They, they, don't, they don't look so glamorous because they're not, they don't involve standing behind a pulpit or doing the big things for the kingdom. But she said that 
her start, the reason that she was so, uh, she was so encouraged to do some of the ministry that she did was because of an aunt that she had. And it was a simple setting. It was Bible school. And she was, I think, 10 to 12, maybe 14 years old, some, somewhere in that area. And she said that uh, her aunt was trying to explain a Bible lesson to the children. And she asked her if she would come forward, kind of like we see the song leader say, come up here and hold the song sheet. And she said, I think you can maybe explain this to, these, to this group in a way that is more, that they can understand better. And this little girl got up and through the encouragement of her aunt, stood on that little stage with that little group and, and gave, served in that moment. And she said there was something that happened that she's close to 50 or somewhere about my age. Today, she still remembers that encouragement that she received. How many other stories are like that? And how has that changed the harvest for how many people? And how many of us here have just a simple, we just have a moment in time that we have an opportunity, I'm gonna to say to carry water so that the harvest can go forward and be a blessing to someone else. It really impressed me. Simple story. And there's so many other stories just like it. Don't quit. Sometimes, sometimes I've had moments where I felt like, what, what does quitting actually look like? I've thought about it. You know, I've heard people say it. I've said it myself. I just feel like quitting. What's the point of going on? What does that actually look like? Just sitting on a chair doing nothing? I, I'm not sure. But I, I can remember times when I just felt like, I'm not sure what to do. And someone else, and I, I hear the voices where someone said, just keep going. Just go another step. Just go. And so if there's someone here this morning that feels like, what's the point? It's not fair. I don't know why I'm in this work environment. I don't know what I'm doing here. Just keep going. The harvest is for those that, that stick with it, that keep pulling the weeds, that keep, that keep tending that, that, that faith. We all know the, the scene of judgment, Matthew 25. I want to end with this because this is very, this is kind of personal to me. This story is something that I often go to when I think of the character qualities and what God is looking for in his people. And I, can't, I cannot separate. God is always looking for a people that will not only take care of their own life, confess their own sins, take care of their own problems. He is looking for a people that serve the world. If you, if you turn to Matthew 25 at the end of that chapter, He's talking about those that were visited in prison, those that were taken care of. And then he, he just to put it in a nutshell, he says, you're coming to heaven, you're, going, you're not going to heaven because, because, why? You didn't serve. You didn't carry water for those that needed it. And the, the, my, one of my favorite, my, one of the, the, Deepest verses that, that I know of, part of it actually, verse 40, is where he says, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so we think this is just a simple matter of, of I live my life, you live your life. No, God is asking that we carry water for each other so that the harvest is good. And we will be judged. We will be called out for what we didn't do and had opportunity to do. Where are your people? You have them. They might be in your house. They might be on the job. And maybe God is asking you to pray for them. But make the harvest good. We talk about making America great again. Let's make the harvest good. Let's be faithful and let's make it good. It is on our shoulders to work diligently in our church, our community, and wherever God has put us.
Let's make it good. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, we are blessed beyond measure this morning. We are better than we deserve to be. We have so much. But Lord, sometimes there are things that that hurt. There are times when we feel like we can't go on. And if there's someone here this morning that feels that way, I lift them to you. I don't even know who I'm praying for, Father, but I know that you do. And so I ask that your spirit would come and move and minister and help keep us going, Lord. There's a harvest coming. We know you've promised that. Father, I just plead with you that you would keep us all faithful until we, all, we can all walk the streets of gold. So come, Lord Jesus, and bless those that need your blessing. We're asking for it just now. We pray in Jesus' name. Maybe seated.